I'm Jash Gembry Stothart, and I'm one of the co founders of Luna, the world's first AI powered health app dedicated to teens. Luna is revolutionizing how teens navigate the complexities of adolescence through our digital health and well being companion. This is 12 year old me. I had low self-esteem, I didn't want to talk about puberty, I just wanted to be normal. Back then, there was little to no health and well-being information to support me throughout adolescence. In fact, I literally relied on magazines because schools didn't teach me what I needed to know. However, today the issue is very different. It's not a lack of information. It's actually misinformation overload. Today, teens are told that they can stop their periods with a shot of lime juice, tagine powder, and salt water. That they shed their skin every month on their period, and that they can lose a whopping eight pounds in three hours by drinking 32 ounces of salt water. Now, obviously, none of this is true. However, these are the latest health trends surfacing on social media, misleading millions of teenagers today. Schools haven't kept up with the pace of change, and parents, no matter how cool you think you are, there's just some things teens don't want to talk to you about. Their go-to places are the internet and social media. Today, more than 10% of teen girls have a bad mental health day every single day. And more than 60% of teens spend over four hours on their digital devices daily. This is the problem, and we're doing something about it. Luna is an AI-powered health and well-being companion for teens to support them throughout adolescence. Everybody goes through puberty. We help them through it. Luna is a one-stop shop platform for girls and non-binary teens aged 11 to 18 years old. And we talk about things like mental health, periods, friendships, skin, and more. So how does it work? Enter demo. On Luna, teens can access content, so articles, videos, and quizzes. They can also ask an anonymous question and get an expert-backed response. And we partner with dermatologists, pediatricians, and medical experts to get the teens their responses. And since we've now had over 50,000 questions to date, we're using the expert data to feed the AI models that are helping us answer these questions. There's also a super simple emotion and period tracker and we're now able to push back health insights to teens and push them recommended content based on how they're using the app. Now, as you can see on Luna, there's no peer-to-peer -peer interactions, making it safe. And we've also included a very quick link for teens to ask for premium memberships to their parents, a bit like Mem Venmo. And we've got a parent layer on top to help parents manage their teens' subscriptions, which we're now building out with content, community, and insights for them too. End demo. Back to slides. Today, we have over 100,000 downloads in 160 countries. And some Luna members have logged in every single day for the last two years, which is when we launched. And after just four weeks of using Luna, the number of teens self-reporting improvement in their body image and mental health has increased drastically. What we have done is the unthinkable. We've made puberty cool. We've created a brand. We've created a community. We've created a girlhood movement where teen girls finally feel excited and empowered to learn about their health. Now, there are 600 million teen girls globally whose needs are underserved, and this more than doubles when you consider boys, preteens, and parents too, making this a multi-billion dollar opportunity. 
And yes, while there are period apps out there and mental health apps out there, they're adult-centric and they're not holistic in nature, leaving an opportunity for Luna. We're currently focused on paid subscriptions and also forming brand partnerships too. And we've currently just launched one with a major sports brand, which we're very excited to announce next week. There's a dual marketing strategy in play, so we're reaching teenagers on the channels they use and showing the value and impact to parents too, meaning we're reaching both members and payers of the product. My co-founder and I met at the University of Oxford, and today we have an incredible team of seven with backgrounds in consumer and health. We also work with medical experts and advisors who have exited and scaled products in this space too. Now, there's one major market left to unlock, and that is the USA. And let me tell you now, there is no shortage of demand when it comes from teens telling us how much they want it to land here. So we'll be launching next year, and I'd be excited to connect with anyone wanting to know more. We have the data. We have the community, and we are already impacting millions of teenagers' lives. Now just imagine how much more we can do to combat the deepening well-being crisis that exists in teen girls today. Everybody knows how much the teen years impact who we become as adults. Everybody here could have done with a platform like Luna. So let's not just let teens survive teenhood in this digital age. Let's help them thrive. Let's give them Luna. Thank you, Luna. Judges. Um, as a mother of a teenage girl, um, I definitely identify with some of the things <laughs> that you're talking about. I would love for her to love puberty. Um, one of the things that I was just wondering about was we've seen apps that are global in nature try to come to the United States and that that crossover is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So things that are popular elsewhere don't become popular here and vice versa. So number one, what gives you the confidence that you will be able to transition here? Not just the, the fact that teenagers want something, but like how do you know they want Luna? And then the second question I had was, you know, how, how, does, how does the knowledge of Luna spread? So are you, using paid advertising and acquisition mechanisms, or is it more word of mouth? Great question. So in terms of how do we know that Luna will land here? Well, um, hopefully you saw a snapshot of the TikTok comments we get messages, emails from teens asking us when it's going to land, and we've currently got a wait list of over a thousand teenagers from different states um, joining this. So every time they ask for it, that's what we do. We share that link. And I think that will help inform our go-to-market strategy in terms of what states these teens are coming from. And we're also now signing up parents too, so parents we've met at TechCrunch who are also asking for this. So I, I think in terms of confidence of demand, those messages really speak volumes. And in terms of how we're getting the message out there, so first and foremost, community has been massive, both from the teenagers, so you know, once you love something, they will tell their friends, but also parents, you'll know that trust, trusted platforms and knowing it's having a positive impact uh, means so much. So we've got referral loops going in there. Second to your point, social media. Somehow a millennial has been able to nail TikTok and I'm very proud of that. Um, and we're using it in a positive way to myth bust, to showcase that you're a teen, you're not the only one thinking about this. And we've been able to do that largely organically. Our hope uh, for next year is to start using paid ad influencers, um, have an affiliate model as well. Uh, so, so for now, it's been community and just really understanding our audience and what they want to see on social media. You, like, you've used this word, sorry, uh -huh. uh, several times, and I also have two uh, young teens and, and, the, and another one behind it, so I uh, could be a lifelong customer here. Um, <laughs> you've talked about the trust and the security of the platform and and how do you maintain that trust? How do you maintain that community? You know, uh, there's also privacy laws and everything else around it, but how do you get people coming back as this is the trusted voice versus you know, degrading into some of the TikTok-like things that we see out there? It's a great question, and it's based, as you said, 
completely on trust and we really listen to our members. So from day one, we have co-created this with teenagers. I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone here we are not teenagers, um, so we, we don't want to sort of dictate what they you know, want. So from day one, we've had um, brand ambassadors who've been co-creating this with us. Um, in terms of the trust side of things, we do get a lot of feedback asking for new content, new features, and one of those, we've had a few people say, oh, is there a place that I can talk to my friend? Can I connect with my friend? And actually, that's one thing we have been firm on, which is actually, no, this is not a social media platform. So as you saw in the presentation, there is no peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and that was very deliberate because there are plenty of platforms like the TikToks and Snapchats of the world where they can communicate with each other. So for us, that's been definitely a guiding principle, but then sort of more on the technology side of how we actually you know, keep it safe and trustworthy. Obviously, everything with our tech is super, super secure, encrypted, different databases for personal information you know, versus what's more publicly available, so like the question and answer section. Um, and that's, again, a very important feature to us, um, to the teens as well, and also to parents. Um, so yeah, there's a few ways. I was early investor in Musical.ly, which was sold to ByteDance and became TikTok. So we saw how they run into uh, growth opportunities and also issues. Mm -hmm. One of which was um, trying to figure out what users really want to use it for uh, initially, how to branch out beyond that. From the data you have seen, uh, what are the top three reasons or usage that your um, current teenage uh, users are using? That's the first question, and how, how is that applicable to uh, American consumers? Second question is that, having gone through Musical.ly, there's COPA, the Children uh, Online uh, Privacy Protection Act in the U.S. that's heavily mm -hmm. enforced. That's not the same in other countries. Mm -hmm. How do you plan to comply uh, with that? Yep. So in answer to the first question, the top three things are the Ask Luna section, as I'm sure you can imagine, finding us and coming onto the platform and realizing there's a safe space that they can ask anonymous questions, um, and that's really important. Secondly is the tracker. So we had a, um, a daily tracker, which you can, we used to be able to come in once a day and track how you're feeling, as you saw in the demo. We got so many requests to say, I feel different in the morning when I come back from school. Can I track twice a day? So now we have them coming back in twice a day to track. Um, and then the third one is challenges. Um, so we are able to sort of test their knowledge and gamify it slightly through challenges and tasks within the app as well. So we have a well-being challenge, which is about to launch uh, Friday, the first of the month. Um, and that's a, another popular part. So that's to answer the first question. Second question about the legislation. That is one of the main reasons why we are yet to launch in the US. So we wanted to make sure when we launch over here, we want to do it properly, we want to be watertight on everything. And that's both from a brand and community side of things. We know you guys do everything much bigger over here than compared to the UK, but more importantly as well on the legislation side of things. So for us, obviously in the UK, we've got GDPR, we've got the Children's Code, but we know over here you obviously have all the different privacy ones, but you have copper guidelines as well for dealing with children and young people. So we are working with the best lawyers as well over in the UK to make sure that when we do land here, we are an, you know, completely watertight on all of that. I'm, I'm really curious, education is somewhat subjective. Of how do you define truth and what, you know, how do you d determine what are correct answers to something when there may be yeah. you know, a spectrum of medical answers to that? And are there topics that are taboo that you're not willing to go into like sex or pregnancy or yeah. other areas like that? Great question. So in terms of what's our guiding star or North Star, for us it's the NHS obviously, um, and we basically take a medical approach to everything we, we, we talk about. Um, if it's grounded in medicine, we're here to tell you facts and not push opinions. So we get questions like, what, what do I do about my body hair? We're not here to tell you to shave it, wax it, or do nothing. We'll tell you the options. Um, so everything is grounded in medicine, created with medical experts, peer-reviewed twice. Um, so that was your first question. And in terms of taboo topics, we t cover everything um, that can be considered taboo because in truth, if you're a digital native, which teens today are, you can get access to any information anywhere. And we would much prefer them to come to a place where it's created by medics and experts and grounded in medicine. But what we do is we don't take a push 
approach, we take a pull approach. So if someone does um, search for something, say, potentially taboo, and also who are we to define what's taboo, we will give them that information because we believe it's better for them to get it from a place that is trusted. But we don't, we don't push that content onto them. So if they're innocently like scrolling and you know, perhaps they've had no ideas of what this taboo topic could be, we won't show it to them. And it's something we thought really carefully about, and perhaps that will change over time. But for now, with the parents we're working with, with the teens we're working with, we feel this dance works. Those people who want that information are getting it, and those who don't know anything about it aren't. Naveen, final quick question. Uh, do we have time? Uh, we, we can squeeze one in. OK, great. <laughs> I'm in charge here. Let's okay. do it. <laughs> awesome. So you guys talked about your downloads, and eventually you want to have a subscription model. But in these kinds of plays, What's your North Star you're trying to establish for engagement? You talked about virality, distribution. Mm -hmm. So what are your guys' thoughts on the engagement front for the users? Yeah, so engagement North Stars, we look at things like weekly active users, monthly active users, time on apps, so number of sessions, average of session length. Um, so they're the ones that we're really focused on. Um, yeah, monthly active users for us can range anywhere between sort of 30% to 50%. Like I mentioned, the wellbeing challenge, um, that is a month-long challenge. There's new tasks sort of every week, and that's something that really drives uh, engagement. So we're always looking to try and improve that and increase that because we have the data to show that actually time on Luna is beneficial. So actually getting them to use more of Luna is definitely not a bad thing. It's all educational and hopefully at the same time fun and enjoyable for them as well. And how are you doing on that front? On engagement, you talked about the MAUs. What about like minutes of use? How do you scale that on a daily basis? Quickly. I'll be quick. So quick one on that is average six times a week. Um, and how we're going to scale that is we're really looking to obviously the, the big players of the world. So the Duolingo's really, um, you know, we have the tracking streak, but there's definitely more things we can do around rewarding points, incentivizing, um, you know, positive behaviors on the platform. Got it. All right. Give it up for Luna. Ooh.